Welcome to this conversation about how to engage in self-directed study of philosophy, specifically that of Thomas Aquinas, a great medieval philosopher and theologian, definitely somebody who you wouldn't want to skip if you're trying to get a good background in philosophy, especially one that's that's rooted in its history. So in these videos, I like to give you the fruits of my own study, reflections, some advice for you that may or may not be helpful, some guidance, and specifically what I'm going to talk about are these topics. First, why should we study Thomas Aquinas in the first place? Then some practical questions about texts. We'll jump right into my suggestions about how and where to start in studying, assuming that you're a beginner. So some of that might be things that you would want to skip past. Um, then we'll talk about understanding Aquinas's own projects and motives and the historical context that he's in, things that might be useful for you to keep in mind. I've got some advice that's derived from the format themselves of his works. And then, of course, with somebody who has drawn so much attention throughout the centuries, there is going to be a, a vast secondary literature out there. We'll talk a little bit about that, who you should read, um, you know, why, with what in mind. And then finally, I'll talk about some problems and issues that do exist that are that talked about, you know, they're controversies. But as a beginner, you don't need to worry about them. It's a little cart before the horse. You need to do some study before they can actually become important and relevant to you. So that is what we're going to cover in this. Some professors and researchers might respond to the question, why should I study this philosopher at all, with a kind of tone deaf and you know condescending and elitist, oh, well, they're important and don't you want to study important philosophy? I think you want to know what am I actually going to get out of this, and that's totally legitimate. Fortunately, we have some good answers. They're not even my answers. They're answers that many other people have provided over centuries about what's worth studying about this, this thinker, Thomas Aquinas. So, you know, the first thing is he is really one of the most important thinkers in Western philosophy for a variety of reasons. And one of them is that he's, you know, developed this pretty systematic point of view, uh, perspective that is well argued and is consolidated in a number of philosophical slash theological works. He's also been massively influential on many other philosophers since his own time. You know, there have always been Thomists, that's followers of St. Thomas Aquinas around, particularly in his order that he belonged to, the Dominican order. But, you know, there have been many other people who have used his thought or responded against it. So it's, it's kind of helpful to know at least the basics about him so you can understand where people who are criticizing his point of view, like early modern philosophers like Thomas Hobbes or Rene Descartes or later 20th century philosophers who are, you know, in some respect, critics and opponents of Aquinas, like Martin Heidegger. Where, where are these ideas actually coming from? Well, if you don't know your Thomas, it might be a little bit harder to understand what they're responding to, what they're taking from him, whether they like it or not. So that's that's one big reason. Or, you know, he's a first-rate philosopher. Actually, it's two reasons. He's also very influential. He's an important thinker within the history of ideas. He uh, contributes a lot of interesting points of view on matters ranging from arguments for the existence of God and criticisms of other arguments to the human emotions, you know, recognizing 
anger and the irascible appetite as concerned with what he calls the difficult good is actually quite an interesting insight. And there's all sorts of other similar things. He's influenced the, the notion of natural law. Uh, the principle of double effect is not solely attributable to, to Aquinas, but certainly has uh, a role within his work. So that we could go on and on and on about that. And th those are reasons to study him. Um, I would also say that, you know, again, on the historical front, if you want to understand medieval appropriations of Aristotle within a context, Aquinas is really an, an important figure. That might not be so important for many people in the present. Um, but I would also say, you know, if you study Thomas Aquinas, one of the cool things that you do get with him as you do with, say, studying Aristotle or studying Rene Descartes or studying Immanuel Kant is that you have a, you know, an, not completely comprehensive, but making a pretty good stab at it and systematic approach to integrating whatever other wisdom there is available at the time. Thomas is trying to do that. And I think that's you know, uh, it, it results in something that you can spend a lot of time studying and perhaps even think is, is correct or true, but it's, it's also interesting to look at, right? And to compare with others. Um, we can also talk about there being ongoing, not a Thomas tradition, singular, but plural. There's, there's a, a number of different interpretations of Thomas out there in the present, some of them with, you know, quite a long tail going back, um, maybe, you know, a hundred years or even several hundred years. And this fertility, uh, this capacity to be interpreted in multiple ways kind of shows you the fruitfulness of the philosophy. And then the last reason that I'll say, and this is one that you would have to verify for yourself experientially by going into the text, I find Thomas quite not only interesting, but enjoyable to read, to think about, and even to teach. Um, so that, that by itself doesn't necessarily mean too much to you unless you take me as a good index of that, but you should check it out yourself. And like with any thinker, you should see whether there's things in their thought that you find particularly captivating or perplexing and that you then respond to and think through on your own. So those are reasons to actually crack open the text and check this guy out. There are a number of practical questions that get raised about, you know, well, which texts and which translations and editions should I go with? And so I am actually going to make a recommendation which is somewhat qualified and i'm going to say well if you're if you're beginning this might be not necessarily the best book to get but at least a good book to get your hands on and it's this uh, selected writings uh, by thomas aquinas that's issued by penguin classics and these are uh, introduced edited and translated by a very important 20th century Thomas, Ralph McInerney, who used to teach at Notre Dame. He's, he's since passed away. And I actually got, I'll tell you a little story. I got my hands on this particular text. I'd been studying Thomas for quite a while when I participated in a summer faculty seminar at the Erasmus Institute at University of Notre Dame with Alistair McIntyre, a very important uh, 20th and 21st century interpreter of Thomas Aquinas who came to it in kind of a roundabout way. And we were doing a very uh, interesting seminar which focused on uh, rational choice theory and its roots in early modern philosophy, psychoanalysis, specifically Freud and Jacques Lacan, and then Aristotelian Thomism. And, and we had like a book reading list uh, that McIntyre assigned us. And this was the standard uh, Thomas text that he wanted us all to have. And I, I think it's, you know, it's decent. 
McInerney is a good translator. It's got a good set of selections. I mean, it doesn't have, of course, you know, the totality of, say, the Summa Theologia in it, because that would be a gigantic book. But it's got a lot of the books that you're going to want to hit on along the way, arranged, you could say chronologically and in terms of, you know, subject matter. So I think this is a good volume to have. I'm also going to mention there is this Blackfriars translation of the Summa Theologiae. I've got quite a few volumes of these. And this is, this is actually where I cut my teeth on Thomas Aquinas. Um, I, I was reading him originally to work on my Latin. And then I was like, wow, this is actually pretty good thought. And what's nice about these Blackfriars editions is that, as you can see, it has what we call facing pages. So the Latin is on one side, the English translation is on the other. So if you are interested in reading Thomas's Latin, um, or if you need to check it for some reason, you can easily do so. And then you've got a translation that could be very good, could be so-so, sometimes misleading. The Blackfriars translations are actually by a whole bunch of different scholars. And some of them are perhaps closer to the text than others. But it's, it's kind of a nice thing to have. If you see these at used bookstores, grab them up if you've got an interest in Thomas Aquinas. You can always give them to somebody else as well. Um, I should mention that you can easily find Thomas's works online. I'm actually going to give you links to two sites that you can go to below. One of them has the uh, Leonine edition, which is all the Latin works. Um, and you can, you know, if you want to read the Latin, Thomas writes fairly simply, uh, you can do so. Then there's also the Isidore site, which has the text in both uh, Latin and English, sometimes actually in facing page format, which is quite nice as well. And, you know, most of Thomas's stuff has been translated at one point or another. Really, all the stuff that you would want to read as a beginner, multiple translations are available for you. And you can find other editions of Thomas's works all, sort of, all over the place online as well. So you don't necessarily need to buy anything. Uh, you can just go online and, and start reading around if you want to. Um, I am going to mention that, and I'm going to talk about this a bit more later on, you're going to notice that Thomas is incorporating and sometimes responding critically to a vast variety of other thinkers and texts. So that's part of his, let's call it method or approach. And it's not just him, it's many other thinkers of the time as well. And it goes all the way back uh, to the ancient period. And it's, it's what we call a dialectical approach. And so more about that in a bit, but I just wanna put that on your radar at the start when we're talking about, about text. So Thomas's text, whatever it happens to be, whether it's a commentary, a disputed questions, a, you know, one of the summas, it's going to be incorporating a lot of other references to other texts within it. And that's something that you, you want to be aware of and attentive to. So, you know, I think that more or less covers the, you know, let's get started practical questions. The other thing that I will mention very briefly, uh, you know, you've heard me talk about Thomas writing in Latin. Of course he did because he's a medieval writing in Western Europe where Latin is the, the language of the land. Thomas in many of his works wrote in a Latin that isn't dumbed down but is deliberately simple and straightforward and easy to read. So if you have any interest in learning Latin, um, he probably would, and you have an interest in Thomas Aquinas, the good news is you'll be able to read his works without you know, putting in massive effort like you would with Cicero or Augustine or some other Latin authors. So that's probably enough about the, the text issues.
Now we come to my suggestions about where and how to start, and that's going to depend in part on you. So as opposed to some of the other thinkers in this series where I can say, okay, this person, start with this book, definitely, this is the introductory volume. There really isn't something like that for Thomas Aquinas, so it kind of depends on what you're looking to get out of it. I mean, I can say that you probably don't want to get yourself too far in the weeds with you know, reading some minor work that doesn't have to do with the larger corpus. But, you know, l let's put it this way. Should I start with a commentary? Should I start with a disputed questions? Should I start with one of the early works? Um, you know, or should I start with the Summa Theologia or the Summa Contra Gentiles? You know, it really depends on what you're looking for. There isn't a simple pat answer to that. So I'll tell you about some of these works and why they could be um, good places. I also want to say, too, so Thomas wrote a lot. If you are going to go into, say, the Summa Theologiae, you know, you're probably not going to read your way through the entire thing and make that your project for the next year or so, um, you're probably going to read selectively, read parts of it. And that's perfectly fine. It's not like reading a short little book, like, say, Descartes' Meditations. You don't want to skip any of the meditations, right? Or Aristotle's Categories. You don't want to skip any of the chapters. With Thomas, you, you actually might, you know. The shorter works, probably you should read the whole of that work. So there are different places where you could start. Um, I, I'll come back to the Summa in just a bit. You know, there are these disputed questions, and some of those could be very interesting for you, like the disputed questions on truth or disputed questions on virtue, if that's what you're particularly focused on. That might be a good way to get into this. I don't really think that commentaries are a good starting point, in part because you, you, you know, unless you're really interested in biblical interpretation, uh, Thomas wrote a lot of biblical commentaries. You probably aren't that interested in that. Um, and the other commentaries are on philosophers and their works, like Boethius or Pseudo Dionysus or Proclus or, for the most part, Aristotle. And, you know, if, if you want to see what Thomas makes of Aristotle, great, that, that's wonderful. But the real action is in, you know, the shorter works, um, like on uh, Essence and Being, you know, De Ante Essentia, or the larger works like the Summa or, or these disputed questions. So, you know, you could start with those sorts of things. Um, if you wanted to, you could start with the Summa Contra Gentiles. That is a shorter work than the Summa Theologia. They're doing somewhat different things. But here's why I'm going to say I, I think for most people, the best place to start would be with selections from the Summa Theologia. And by the way, you know, you can get those sort of selections in this volume that I brought up before, the Selector Writings, translated by Ralph McInerney. Um, so the Summa is this pretty vast work that Thomas hadn't actually finished when he died. Um, but there's, there's enough there. Don't worry about, you know, whether it's complete or not. And, you know, you can go through and check out particular topics, questions, issues that you're interested in. So this volume, for example, the very first volume in the work, um, it's got a uh, uh, sort of subtitle. Actually, this is volume two, Existence and Nature of God. I, I misspoke there. So, you know, that's what, what we're focused on. In this, you know, there's whether there is a God, God's simpleness, God's perfection, the general notion of God, goodness, limitlessness, existence in things, unchangeableness, eternity, oneness, and then a lot of, you know, extra stuff in there, some appendices. So, I mean, you might check out bits and pieces of the, the Soma like that. And you don't have to feel as if 
you must begin with the very beginning of the summa and then work your way to the stuff that you're more interested in. If you're interested in um, law, there is an entire thing that's often called the treatise on law. And that's parts of the summa that have to do with the various kinds of law. Or if you're interested in the emotions, there's several different areas of the summa that are discussing that. So I would say that what you want to do is not just get yourself like a big collection of the summa, but rather figure out what you're really interested in and then start picking at it there. That's my suggestion for where to start. And that's going to keep you busy for quite a while. And I think it's perfectly fine. Actually, I encourage it for you to like go between texts as well. Um, and the reason I think that um, that's okay, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more later on, is that there are, there are complementary discussions from one text to the next. So that might be of interest to you as well. You don't have to feel like you have to finish the Summa Contra Gentiles before reading something else. Um, you can go back and forth. But I would, I would say, you know, for probably most of you, you want to begin with selections from the Summa Theologiae, unless you deliberately want to start with a shorter work. And then, you know, maybe um, there, there's a couple early ones that are often um, brought up that could be quite useful for you. I've already mentioned the on being and essence. Um, on the principles of nature could also be nice, depending on what you're really interested in as well. It'll give you sort of a flavor for what Thomas is doing. So that's my advice about where to start. I realize that it's a little bit less coherent than in some of the other videos, but that's in part because of the format of Thomas's works and how many of them we have. A bit of historical context and some discussion of Thomas's projects and motivations might be helpful for you as you start approaching his work. So, you know, Thomas is a high medieval ages Western thinker. He's writing and thinking in Latin. Uh, he's got a lot of works at his disposal. He's um, several generations into the, not, I won't say rediscovery of Aristotle, but the, the newly available translations of Aristotle's corpus, including a few books that actually weren't Aristotle, but were attributed to him that, um, you know, most people at that time thought were his, and, and we know that they're not, that sometimes Thomas will actually bring up, like the book, you know, uh, various uh, uh, books that are by Neoplatonists. Thomas also has access to other things as well, a vast corpus of writings that the monks have preserved, things that are becoming available, uh, medieval commentators who, you know, they have to be translated into Latin, but, but are actually uh, Arabic commentators. There's actually a project just down the road at Marquette University called Aquinas and the Arabs Project that has been bringing a lot of those connections to light. There's uh, other Aristotelians that Thomas is responding to. So you get the idea, he's living in a time and specifically in a place, he's in Dominican houses of study and at Paris as well, where he gets to study and then he also gets to teach. Um, sometimes, you know, in the crosshairs of certain people, the Bishop of Paris, uh, for example, Etienne Templier. Um, but Thomas has access to a whole lot of texts and he is trying to assimilate, to integrate all of this potential knowledge because you don't know whether people really have things correct or not, right? You have access to Seneca, for example, but maybe Seneca's got some things wrong. Thomas you know, is not going to just automatically say Aristotle's right. Uh, and even other theologians, Thomas will sometimes disagree with them or reinterpret their positions, even scripture. He's not a fundamentalist in the 20th century and 21st century sense where he says, ah, the Bible says, therefore this. By the way, 
Thomas never talks about the Bible. He talks about Holy Scripture. And whenever he does that, he's usually thinking about a particular book because this notion of like one big seamless document, that's a very l later modern idea that, that wasn't very common uh, during the Middle Ages. So anyway, um, Thomas is a, a thinker and he's committed to the idea that the higher part of ourself, which was created by God, needs to be developed and cultivated. And that is what study, critical examination of arguments, positions, texts, that is what it, it, is, it is intended to do. And that is what motivates his many, many writing projects. He is trying to work out reliable knowledge that other people can, in fact, use. So there's kind of a practical aspect, particularly with the Summa Theologia. The Summa is written, as Thomas says, not for experts, but for beginners. Now, not beginners is like, you know, necessarily walk in off the street with no background whatsoever. Uh, you know, these beginners, by the time they get to theology, they would have studied the liberal arts and some philosophy, and then they would, they would study philosophy. But it should also be useful to people who are going out into the priesthood and may get stationed in some podunk town and need this, this guidance to help them figure things out as they're dealing with their parish's problems and their parishioners' struggles and all of those sorts of matters. So that's, that's part of what's motivating his work there. He thinks that there is a lot of truth available, and part of what you need to do is work through all of those matters. So you can address problems, you can address errors, you can address confusions. And the way that you do that is by sifting through these various texts um, and, and thinkers and figuring out who's got things right and who doesn't. And we're going to talk about that dialectical method a little bit more. Um, he's also interested in making sure that we can highlight and try to push aside or eliminate mistaken points of views on matters. And Aquinas, as many historians have pointed out, is kind of straddling a middle path. On the one hand, you have these wild Aristotelians, Averroes they're often called, who think that, you know, Aristotle's got everything right, and if secular knowledge, philosophical knowledge, conflicts with the scripture, then too bad for scripture, the philosopher's right. On the other hand, you have people that are kind of like today's fundamentalists, you know, uh, some of them actually, like Peter Damien, thought that grammar was a tool of the devil. Not everybody was quite so extreme. And then you got people like Thomas in between saying, hey, we need to cultivate the human mind so that it can know God, so that we can uh, administer justice within civil society, so people can develop as human persons. And all of these are integrated with each other. So those, I think, are some, some motivations. And you don't have to share in those or even appreciate those, but that will help you as you approach Thomas's works. Here we come to what's probably my favorite part, because I like to talk about methods and methodology and approaches that people take. So Thomas is very distinctive. If you've ever cracked open one of his disputed questions or either of the summas or, you know, some other works as well, you're going to see that there's a, a definite format or structure to them. And this is, in some respect, indebted to Aristotle's own dialectical approach, but it's, it's more formulaic, it's more structured. So let, let's take the Summa Theologiae, right? Whenever we come to um, an article, which is sort of the basic building block of discussion. So there are questions and then there are articles, right? 
and um, each of them, you know, are, are sort of organizational um, things. There's also parts, right? So we should say there's parts, then there's questions within those parts, then there's articles within the questions. So within an article, you're going to see a question being raised. So here's just one for example. Does God exist in everything? Okay, so we've got a question put before us, or sometimes it's does, sometimes it's whether. Uh, it could be a bunch of different things. And then he'll say, um, here's an argument, right? And he'll give an argument from somebody. In this case, it's from scripture for the first one. Um, and then we get Augustine for the second one. And we actually have four here. And then we get another argument that we're not quite sure where it's coming from, but Thomas arranges it. And then we get uh, another argument that's being made and citing St. Paul, right? So those are the arguments uh, for a particular point of view. And then we get a on the contrary, or on the other hand, said contra, another argument being given for this. Now, in the Summa Theologia, yeah, that's typically how it goes. Um, in others, there may be, here's 10 arguments for, here's five arguments against. Now, all of that is Thomas setting out a range of possible ideas positions on a particular question. And this is, this is an approach that he inherited from his teacher, Albert the Great, and from other scholastics that are around at the time. Thomas didn't come up with this, but he's using it. And then after that, he will say, I respond that, responsio, and he will tell you his point of view. And usually his point of view is going to be kind of complicated and nuanced. He'll say, well, you know, this is right. This is, this is not right. Here's some distinctions that we need to make. Here's how the, the issue that we're being asked about is going to be resolved. And then he will have responses to the arguments that were given at the start. And sometimes he's clarifying something. He's not just saying, well, that argument is wrong and here's why. He'll say, here's why that argument might actually look right, or this is this part over here, this isn't bad, but this part over here, this is clearly erroneous. That is Thomas's basic approach that we find in the disputed questions, in a lot of the smaller works, in the summas. Um, and why is he doing things that way? So I mentioned this dialectical method. Aristotle, back in his time, if you look at a lot of Aristotle's works, he often begins by talking about what other people in the past or even in the present have to say about the topic that he's studying. So in On the Soul, let's look at some previous ideas about the, the human soul, you know, and how it works and what its parts are and all that. Now, why is he doing that? Because he wants to critically examine what could be right and what might be wrong in those and take the stuff that's good and push aside the stuff that's not to affect a better, greater synthesis of or integration of the things that are actually on point. So that is what Thomas is doing in those sorts of works. And it's important to, to recognize that, you know, when you're reading Thomas, you have to distinguish between what he's saying other people say and then examining and what he actually puts forward as his own position. So there's that part. And then Thomas writes a lot of commentaries as well. And if you haven't read many commentaries, I would actually say don't jump into those right away. Um, you know, what a commentary is, is you're taking a text by a particular person and you are explaining and providing examples and maybe even to some degree correcting or putting into different formats what their thoughts are. So, you know, for example, this is Thomas Aquinas's commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And, you know, what we get in this is, um, you know, there's the text of Aristotle, 
which was, by the way, in Latin. Uh, Thomas couldn't, couldn't read it in the, in the original Greek. And then we get Thomas's own commentary on that section of the text. Works the same way for biblical literature. Thomas has a vast variety of commentaries on various books of the Bible. Um, only one of them wasn't finished, the commentary on the Psalms, because he died before it was uh, finished. Um, along with the, the, he was also working on the Summa Theologiae. And, um, you know, we've got a few commentaries as well on, you know, for example, Pseudo Dionysus on the Divine Names, you know, Boethius on the Trinity. And those are all, you know, Thomas taking the text and saying, here's, here's what's actually going on. Here's what some other people have to say about this. Here's how we can take these ideas and put them in a more rigorous, like, syllogistic framework. So that's a, a genre of literature. And again, sort of par for the course at the time. There is uh, one other thing that I really want to bring up about um, format of the works that I think is, is quite important. So Thomas isn't unique in this respect, but he's perhaps one of the people to whom this applies the most of, of, of thinkers that I've read, you would expect quite naturally that everything that Thomas wants to say about a particular topic should be found in the, the text, the portion of the text where he's explicitly talking about that. So for example, um, there is a section in the Treatise on Emotions where Thomas, uh, actually a couple sections, where Thomas is talking about anger, right? Anger as uh, an emotion, part of what he calls the irascible appetite. And so everything that we need to know about that should be contained there. Well, no, it doesn't quite work like that. There'll be all sorts of other bits and pieces, discussions, that end up touching on it and adding to his um, framework, doctrines, conception in important ways, and they will be in other parts of his text. So be prepared for this to be the reality as you're reading through things. You think, ah, I've totally got a handle on uh, the five ways, you know, and what it means for uh, God to be a cause. And then later on, you're going to read something else in the Summa, and you're going to be like, well, wait a second, that actually kind of changes the picture, or adds to the picture of what was going on here. That's just the way it is with a lot of thinkers' works. That's the way it is with Aristotle. That's the way it is with, with you know, Thomas Aquinas. That's the way it is even with people like Immanuel Kant. Not everything is in the section where you think it's supposed to be. Um, so you do have to kind of read around. And the cool thing about that is you'll have all these great experiences of saying, holy crap, this bit of information over here really adds to the account that I was getting from this part of the Summa or in the disputed questions or things like that. So there's some correlation that you have to do um, and you're going to notice there's one other thing that I do want to point out. Uh, you're going to notice, as I mentioned, Thomas is referring to a great number of different thinkers. And over time, if you read enough Thomas, you kind of get to put together a composite picture of, well, what does Thomas actually think about Augustine or John Damascene or Anselm or Seneca or, you know, pick whoever else you want. But it's, it's, again, bringing together a lot of like bits and pieces from different discussions where these people are being referenced and used. So that's probably enough about um, the format of the works. Uh, we've got some, a few other things to talk about. I put off any discussion about secondary literature, that is, people who are writing about Thomas's thought and interpreting it to this point. I, I mentioned it a bit already, but now we actually have to uh, 
grab that gigantic bull by the horns. And why do I speak in such hyperbolic language? Because the secondary literature on Thomas Aquinas is vast and marked by controversy. There is no standard take out there. And anybody who tries to tell you that there is, is lying to you or misinformed, or I don't know what else is wrong with their brain. Um, there, there's many different Thomisms out there in the present. And these are interpretations of the works and thought of Thomas Aquinas. Um, so it's almost inevitable that if you get interested in Thomas Aquinas, people are going to suggest to you secondary literature, and you may in fact benefit by reading some, you know, very interesting and insightful thinkers who work with Thomas Aquinas. And there's, there's some really great ones out there. Um, that said, you, you can just read Thomas by himself. You, you don't necessarily have to read Thomas through the lens of this person or that person or this school or that school. It's okay to read Thomas's text just by themselves. Um, but there is a vast literature and there's a bit of a historical background to this. So, you know, Thomas Aquinas never quit being read and taught within the uh, Dominicans and a few other orders who used him as well. But you can say that, you know, from being one of a number of important thinkers in the Middle Ages, his popularity declined considerably in the modern period. And then there was what we call the Thomist revival. And this was in Catholic circles. It was not Protestants or secular thinkers who were particularly interested in Thomas. And more and more people start getting interested in him in Catholic circles in the 19th century. And then in the late part of the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII uh, issues this encyclical, Iterni Patris. Some people will try to tell you that this made Thomas Aquinas the official philosopher of the church. If you actually read the document, that's not the case. Thomas has never been the official philosopher of the church because the church has never, the Catholic church has never had an official one single person philosopher. But what you can say is that the attorney Patris gave a massive impetus to, you should, you should take Thomas seriously, at least among Catholics. So a lot of Catholic thinkers used their study of Thomas Aquinas to articulate their own ideas about things. And a lot of this would be like, well, you know, how would Thomas respond to, say, the challenge of post-Kantian philosophy? Or how would Thomas respond to Hegel? Or how would Thomas, you know, incorporate this? Or how should we read Thomas? What, you know, all, all of these different sorts of approaches. And so in the 20th century, at least the first part of the 20th century, we get a variety of Thomisms. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to hold up one book. So Alistair McIntyre, Three Rival Versions of Moral Inquiry. This is the third book in his tetralogy that begins with After Virtue. McIntyre became a Thomist. By the time that he writes this book, he is committed to Thomas Aquinas as having most things right. And he's got a chapter in here, chapter three, called Too Many Thomisms. <laughs> Why? Because he's talking about the attorney Patris. You get all these different rival schools coming out of the Thomist revival. And so I'll just mention a few of these. There's what's sometimes called the neo-scholastic or, you know, uh, the, the strict Thomists, you know. Uh, Garrigou Lagrange would be, Reginald Garrigou Lagrange would be a good example of that. Um, and, you know, just, I'm going to joke around a little bit. They could be called the stick in the mud Thomists because they don't really like anybody else and they think everybody else has got things wrong. We have the transcendental Thomists, you know, Joseph Marshall, Karl Rahner, Bernard Lonergan, that's still an ongoing thing. Um, we have existential Thomists, you know, Etienne Gilson, uh, um, 
Jacques Maritain are probably the biggest names in that. Ralph McInerney was somewhat influenced by them, as well as by the Thomas of the, the Strict Persuasion as well. Um, the Lublin School, which actually uh, wound up uh, producing a pope, Carol Wojtyla, uh, also known as John Paul II, <laughs> you know, kind of a big thing there. And they were looking at Thomism <clears throat> and phenomenology, which, by the way, some of the existential and uh, transcendental Thomists were as well. Um, you know, we have uh, analytic Thomists, and then we have all sorts of other things. You know, uh, Marshall McLuhan claimed that he was a Thomist of sorts. John Dealey, the great semiotician, uh, viewed what he was doing. He's very influenced by Jacques Maritain, but also by John of Poinceau, uh, another great uh, scholastic. Um, Alistair McIntyre himself, you know, his his form of Thomism is very methodological and sort of engaged with other uh, traditions and things. So there isn't a single Thomism out there. And anybody who tries to tell you that there's there's one or this is the, the right one or you need to read this particular person, you know, either they're ignorant or they're biased or they're they're trying to sell you something. So there's a great many different thinkers out there. I could recommend some of the people who I particularly like, uh, many of whom are not all that contemporary. Um, they're, you know, like early 20th century Thomas, but that might not mean that much to you, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. I'll just mention a few people. I'm a big fan, obviously, of Alistair McIntyre, uh, still around today. I'm also a huge fan of Norris Clark, who uh, has some really great stuff on the Neoplatonist roots of Thomas's thought. I'm a big fan as well of um, Antonin Sertillan, who you probably haven't heard of and not too many Thomas scholars today have, but he was greatly influenced by Maurice Blondel and, and others as well. Uh, Pierre Rousselot, we're getting a little bit further back in time as well. Uh, these are, you know, I, I could mention a bunch of other names, but they may not mean that much to you. And I don't think that just because I like those guys, you have to like them. And you don't have to, like, necessarily read the latest people who are writing on Thomas Aquinas either. You can, it, it's perfectly fine not to go to secondary literature and just read Thomas on your own. It's also perfectly fine to go to secondary literature looking for help, looking for uh, explanations, looking for assistance. The one thing that you just want to do is be careful and critical that you're not accepting this person's take on Thomas as if it's a substitute for Thomas Aquinas's thought itself. So I'm not going to make any big recommendations about secondary literature in part because there's just so much of it out there that, you know, this video would, if I wanted to be comprehensive, this video would be hours and hours long. So that's where we're going to stop that part. All right, last bit, a few problems and issues that I think you don't need to worry about. Um, one of them is like distinguishing the philosophy from the theology. There is no standard distinction that everybody buys into. So is Thomas a philosopher? Is Thomas a theologian? Yes, he's both. And I don't think you need to, as a beginner, worry too much about that. Um, I also think that you don't need to worry, you know, when it comes to secondary literature, who's got Thomas more right than others. That's something you'd only know after you've actually read enough Thomas, right? So anybody who you're going to take as your guide, you're kind of taking on trust. Um, another thing that I think you don't need to worry that much about is Thomas's status as a Catholic philosopher, or let alone the official Catholic philosopher. We've already talked about that. You know, you can read him without worrying about any of that sort of stuff. Um, interestingly, in the present, Thomas is less read by Catholics, and there are a lot of Protestants in the, the present, at least here in America, who are quite interested in using Thomas Aquinas. 
Um, so I think a lot of those sort of issues and worries and questions are kind of old hat and you don't have to be too concerned with it. Um, do you need to be religious to read Thomas Aquinas or believe in Aristotelian hylomorphism? No, like with any thinker, you can just read them. You can read Nietzsche without being a Nietzschean. You can read Kant without being a Kantian. You can read Aristotle without being an Aristotelian. Likewise, you can read Thomas Aquinas and understand him and make progress through his works without necessarily agreeing with all of his starting points, commitments, or anything like that. So those are issues that I wouldn't worry too much about at this point. The key is to, you know, start reading. If, if you are going to study Thomas, and there's nothing that says that you absolutely have to. I gave you some good reasons at the beginning, but if you are going to read him, you know, focus on learning and generating an understanding of this vast, complex uh, body of work by this, this great philosopher. All right, a few final words. I think Thomas is well worth studying. I, that's why I put time into this video for you to help you out. Um, I think that, you know, he's sort of a long haul. It's not like starting out with a thinker who we only have a few texts by, like Epicurus, for example. You can't read much by him. There's a lot. And so if you are going to study him, you know, do it in bite-sized chunks. Don't overwhelm yourself. You don't have to fully understand everything that Thomas said at every single time. I will actually say that I think that there's very few people out there who have even read the totality of the Summa Theologiae from the very beginning to the end where, you know, Thomas left off. Uh, and that's okay. So I think it's great if you want to study Thomas Aquinas. You're going to find he's, he's a very interesting thinker who has a lot of great stuff to say, things to, to contemplate, to ponder, maybe to disagree with, maybe to incorporate. I know that there are certain things of uh, his that I have found very useful and continue to teach in my own classes. So that's enough about that. Now it's up to you to go out and start your study.